team, as always, you know, I usually get the privilege of sitting up with the praise team. It's awesome to be out there and, and hearing them play. So I'd like to shout out to Lauren. Lauren has so faithfully uh, led the worship team. And if you knew her whole story, it's not something she asked for. It's not something she wanted to do by any means. And, and God has really grown, grown her, and it's, it's an honor to serve with her on the worship team. So thanks, Lauren. All right, uh, so I get the, the honor of, of sharing a little bit of God's word with you this morning. Um, I'm going to be in James chapter 1, if you have a Bible or app or something like that. Um, uh, I got to speak on this topic um, a few times I've gotten to preach, two or three times. I, I spoke on this last year, the same topic, and I just was thinking about it as I led up to this Sunday, and I just thought about how applicable it still was and how I needed to keep learning more about this topic. Um, so I'm going to talk about joy. And the big idea behind what I'm going to talk about this morning is that God wants to develop joy and steadfastness in you in spite of your trials that you face in your life. Uh, and it's kind of a counterintuitive idea, uh, but the Bible is really full of, of this theme. And so uh, what we'll work through James and, and talk about that uh, and learn about how God really wants to develop that kind of joy in you that can withstand trials uh, in a way so that you're not as surprised by them. Um, so again, in James uh, chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 2 through 12. Um, so I'd like to read that text, and, and then we'll pray and get started. So count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like the waves of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers falls, and the beauty perishes. So also will a rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, as we slow our hearts and our minds from what has no doubt have been a busy week, um, full of its own trials and joys, uh, we ask that you would block away all the distractions in our lives, the things that can keep us away from you. Let us hone in on your word and who you are, and pray that you'd open our hearts even now to hear what you would have us learn uh, from this book of James. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who loves us. You're a God who cares for us and is bigger and stronger than any problem this world can throw our way. Uh, we thank you and claim that promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. Get me out of the way, Lord. Allow my words to be merely your words flowing through me. Let people see you through this morning. We love you. Amen. Okay, uh, so what I would like to kind of break this down in, in three sections uh, and kind of go through verse by verse and kind of what, and again, I'm not, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a master expert in theology, so this will not be a theology lesson as much as it will hopefully be uh, what God has shown a simple person uh, on, on how great he is um, and some lessons he's taught me kind of in my life. Um, so I think the first question we have to ask when we look at verse 1, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, we have to ask what, what joy is. And I think if I asked each of you individually in an interview setting what joy was, you'd probably all give me a little bit different answer, right? Um, and there's multiple ways to view joy. And I think even when you look up joy in the dictionary, it will give you three possible definitions. And, and so there's the world's kind of view of joy, and that would usually be related to happiness. We would usually say that um, it's getting control of your life in a way that your circumstances are favorable, and therefore you're happy, right? So you have a, a happy marriage, you have a good job, you have uh, the car you want, your kids are semi-behaving, and overall you have, you would call that happiness, right? It would be, a, you know, the good American life or how you want to look at it. That would be happiness. Uh, Christian joy is, is very, very different than that. The Christian joy is talking about something that actually in spite of and through challenges, it actually is, you still have joy. So that's very different, right? Actually in unfavorable circumstances, James would argue that it actually can even be stronger, your joy in what you have. And that doesn't sound right. And so let's, let's break that down and talk about it. Uh, so it says there, first of all, that count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And so I thought I had my first doubt because it says meet. And I thought, you know, when you bump into a trial every now and then, well, actually, the Greek doesn't help us here. It actually means encompassed by or surrounded by trials. So count it joy when you're surrounded by trials and tribulations. And when I say trials in this setting, it, it usually means challenges in life, things that are, are coming at you. Uh, he says, uh, you know, the, the idea of trials is this idea of testing. 
uh, and the Greek word is dokimos. It's the only Greek word I'm going to tell you today. Dokimos, um, and I, I say this one because it's very, very interesting. Dokimos uh, were, were a people uh, in biblical times, and their role was to certify money. And so if you think about um, back in the day, it was kind of one of the first systems to use coinage, and so you have a coin with a stamp of Caesar's face. You've probably all heard that story. And so it's a metal coin that's shaped in a certain image. And so you can see how that'd be very easy to counterfeit in many ways, and you can see why people would have an interest just like now in counterfeiting money. You don't have watermarks and bills, and you don't hold it to the light, and you can't use a pen to make sure it's right. So back then, how did you verify that money was correct or real? So you had these individuals called dokimos, and what they would do is they were certifiers of money. If you wanted to know that your money was sound, you'd take it to them, and they would test it. They'd evaluate that money and decide, yes, this is certified, you know, good old Roman or Greek money, depending on what you're looking at. And so these individuals were, were trusted as certifiers. They had that stamp. They had a better business career, or whatever you want to call it, but they were certified as the ones to do that. And so what this is talking about is that the thing that's being tested here is your faith and that these trials are ways to test that faith to see if it is true, if it is real, if it is certified. And so every time that faith is being tested by these trials, it's evaluating to see how you respond. And then you can think about your own life. When a trial comes your way, how do you respond? Or think about someone you know who responds really, really well, a solid Christian friend of yours maybe, that that, that trial comes their way and it's almost like it doesn't even phase them because they, they think so logically through what it means. Um, and so I don't know how to explain it, but you're, you're kind of your, your faith shows through the trials more evidently. So someone on the other side who your faith is not strong, those trials are going to sway you back and forth. It's going to throw you back and forth. It's going to you know, agitate you, uh, and you're going to respond in frustration, anxiety, depression. Um, and so if you see that your life is characterized by responding to trials in that way, then it's a test, and it's showing there might be something wrong on the inside. So let's evaluate that. Okay, so it says that after that, the reason why you want to do that is because the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, we don't use steadfastness very often, but I think you can kind of get the gist of what it means. But it kind of means, I think the best word for it is resilience. In the military, we use it probably a little too much these days. Um, but resilience is a really good term to describe, kind of being able to withstand uh, things that come your way in different ways. So it's saying that if, you, if that testing of your faith, these trials that happen over time, you're going to be more steadfast when things come. And I think we all want that. I think we all would say, well, I, I want to be resilient in the midst of trials and tribulations, um, especially here in Aviano. And I know, I think some of you maybe aren't military affiliated, but many of you are. And most of you would say that there's some unique challenges to living in Aviano. You'd say that there's some, whether it's the plugs or the currency exchange or the, the language challenges or no base housing, there's some challenges and trials associated with living here. Um, and wouldn't we like to be the ones who are resilient in those circumstances and are able to respond to it in a positive way? Um, it says here that by testing our faith, we develop steadfastness in the ability to respond. And if you're like me, I'm like, okay, sweet, I want that. How do I do it? Can I have it right now? Can I have a trial and be steadfast? And it, that's not the case. It says, let it have its perfect work. And actually, Matthew Henry, in his commentary, says that it's a process that's active, it's living, and it takes time. And each one is like building a layer of resilience as you go through these trials over time. It's not an instant one hit, one kill. And so that's interesting, but also frustrating, because it's going to take some time. Uh, when we look at how we respond to trials, if you're like me and you're a person of action, you're like, okay, sweet. How do I respond to this? Let, let, me, let, me, let me crush this thing. Um, Tim Keller, awesome, awesome uh, author. He's a pastor at, at Redeemer Church in New York City. I encourage you to look up his books, his sermons, whatever. Um, but he talks about how we as Christians have a risk of going to one extreme or the other when it comes to responding to trials. And what he says is you can either be this stoic person. A lot of, just sorry, men, we do this a lot of times where you bow up and say, trial's not that tough. I got this, I'm, I'm a strong dude, nothing that trial can phase me. That's one option. The other option is this kind of masochistic approach, which is kind of interesting, but you're pretty much saying, woe is me, this, bring it on, this pain hurts me, I'm so sad, woe is me. So those are both extremes, but there's something really interesting. Both those, did either of those have it to do with God? Did the I've got this or the woe is me have to do with God? Neither of them did. In between is this perspective that says, I am strong because he is strong. These trials are hard, and they are difficult, but, it, but God is in control. So there's this in-between, if that makes sense, because the, the Pharisees would actually, on the masochistic side, they would twist their faces to show, like, oh, it's so painful to deal with these burdens that God has given me, right? Um, and that was the wrong approach. And I couldn't help, as I was looking through this, to think about Facebook, you know, to think about um, some people who are maybe a little bit masochistic about the trials in their life on Facebook, um, posting about things challenging their life. And there's good reasons to do that, to post challenges, to request for a prayer and ask for encouragement and, and, and share frustrations with each other. That's absolutely the case. But how many times do you see a post that you can tell it's, it's not to ask for help, it's to point 
look back at me. Look what I am going through. Look at my experience. And again, it's more, it's all a pride thing on either side. Either I'm proud and I can handle it, or I'm proud, look at me and all my troubles. And so we've got to be very careful about either side of those and find the kind of the in-between. Um, okay, so that's the steadfastness piece, to be able to withstand because of what he does, not because of what we do. And so um, as we look at why, so again, it's a step process. You, you withstand the trials, it tests your faith. You develop steadfastness. Why? So you can be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Who wants to be perfect and complete? Lacking in nothing. I think we all do. That sounds pretty good, right? I, wanna, I, wanna, I would love to be that. That sounds good. Um, Philippians 1.6 says this, but I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. The promise is that you will be perfect and complete. If you are someone who has put your faith in Christ, this process will work to the end and you will be complete in the end. That's exciting. The fact that there's a process being happening, but it doesn't mean it's easy throughout the time that we're getting there. Um, Romans 8, 28 through 30 is, is a great section of scripture as well. I encourage you to read chapter 8 uh, in your study this week if you've got some time and you don't know where to go. But it talks about in Romans 8, 28 through 30, uh, the verse that God works together all things for good that, for those that love him. Um, Tim Keller talks about it as a blessing box verse where you pull it out and say, ah, oh, that's lovely, that feels nice. And you just pull it out and use it, pull it out of context. Um, that's not really what it's saying. I think a lot of times when, when I first read it growing up, it was always, um, if I love God, good things will happen to me. That's how I read that verse. That's not what a promise says. It says that God will work it together for his good, all things. Good things, bad things, in between things. He will work all those things together for his good. Well, that's a little bit different. Is God's good different than what we would view as good, probably, in our perspective compared to his perspective? I think so. Um, a tough example is just think about someone who's passed away in your life. Um, if that passing away leads to four or five other people accepting Christ as their Savior, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's kind of tough to answer that question, right? But if it's God's perspective, and we think about how he sees the world, all mission, on, on, on the present, all powerful person, viewing that situation, he may see that as good in the end. And so we've got to change our perspective on what we think is good and realize that all those things, good and bad, will be used for his glory in the end. Francis Chan uh, punches you in the gut a lot, and this is what he says. He said, God doesn't want to make you happy. He wants to make you holy. And what I mean by that is, again, the happy the way the world sees it, where your circumstances are favorable. He's not trying, God does not see value in getting you to a point where everything is lined up perfectly and beautiful in your life. Because guess what? When things are great in your life, are you turning to him frequently? Or do you find yourself feeling like you got it? You're in control. It's in those times when you're stressed and those times of trial that you find you need him more, you lean on him more. And so situations like that actually grow us. I think there's a really, really good um, analogy of this, an example of this, or illustration that shows this whole process. So if you're not a miner, like I'm not a miner, you don't really understand the metal ore refining process. So I had to learn about it, and I'll describe it to you. So when, when gold is taken, let's say, out of a mine, it's, it's in an ore form. So you have gold in there, of course, but you also have rock, you have sediment, you have stone. Everything's kind of mixed together in a, in a big ball. And they have a process of refining that to get the gold out. And the way they do that is they, they add heat. They add heat to it over and over again. And what happens is the gold melts out, and, and what rises to the top is all that sediment, that dirt, that trash, everything else. And that's called dross, and they scrape it off the top, and then they do it again, and again, and again, until what's left is pure gold. So if you think about the gold as, as Jesus, as our, as our faith with him, if you think about that rock and sediment as all those other things in your life that kind of distract you, the heat is the trial being applied to that ore, if that makes sense. And so what that heat is doing is it's targeting those things in your life that you feel like are more important and saying none of them matter compared to him. None of them matter compared to the joy of knowing him. Um, a little bit of confession time here. M my, my rock, my sediment, my thing that I hold on to is my work. I value my work. I value succeeding in my work. That's my, my old man. I want to be, be, be successful. I want to be seen as successful. So I guess where most of my trials end up being in my work. It's fascinating, really. When you start looking back over over time, I see that most of my trials or the things I feel like are trials because it bothers me the most are things in my work because that's what I value. And so God continues to present trials to test my faith and say, Adam, are you going to hold on to that rock, that stone, that sediment, or are you going to accept this gold that I have for you that's me? And so that heat keeps being applied over and over and over again, and it takes a process. And so I ask you the question, what are your impurities? What are your, what are your rock and your sediment in your life that you hold on to when those trials come? What's that thing that God targets with the trials? Um, it could be really good things, people. It could be family. It could be church. It could be these things that are really good, and so you hold on to for those reasons, but it pales in comparison to knowing Jesus. And 
when you think about people who, we talked about kind of at the beginning, individuals who are able to respond with resilience to a trial, it's people who get that already, understand that nothing's more important than him. So when that trial comes, they go immediately think, okay, if you're doing this to me, God, what is that thing? And, and how can I let go of it and, and turn back to you? It's almost like just a wake-up call as opposed to this dramatic life event. Does that make sense? Um, so that person's kind of more in sync with God. Um, because the reality is this, is that everything will disappoint you, but, but he never will. Everything will disappoint you. Everything in life, all those great things in the world will disappoint you, but he never will. I think the best verse, uh, my, my blabbering cannot answer what, what the Bible has to answer this whole thing and put it all in one beautiful place. And it's Philippians 3.8, and it says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, maybe sediment, rock, and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So Paul realized that. Paul was one of those resilient people, understood that nothing mattered compared to the joy of knowing Christ. And he calls it rubbish. And actually the word there is S-H-I-T. That's the actual translation. It's not just uh, trash. It's, it's I count it as excrement compared to knowing him. Everything else in the world pales in comparison. Pretty powerful. So the implication is this, that trials produce steadfastness and completeness when we respond to it appropriately, when we allow God to do, do his work through those trials and testings. Okay, so we saw in verse 2 through 4 about how God kind of lays out the process for how he uses trials in our life. Uh, and then in verses 5 through 8, we see why wisdom and how wisdom can play a role in this. So 5 through 8, I'll read that again. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, uh, stable in all his ways. So it's pretty much saying that it jumps right from this process to wisdom. So, so why is it doing that? It's saying that immediately when these trials face our lives, we need to look up and ask God for wisdom. It's the, the, these verses are not beside each other for no reason. It's, it's there for a purpose. Uh, and it says that when we respond to it, that he will give us wisdom. And I think we read that and say, oh, cool, he'll give us wisdom. No, it, it's serious here. He's saying that he will actually give us wisdom. It's a promise that we can claim. And it says without reproach. And I didn't really understand how that applied without reproach. And, and again, the root of the word, not giving you it in Greek, the root of the word pretty much says, it's talking about rank and position. It's saying that when he looks at you and decides that he's going to give you wisdom, he does not see your status. He does not see your rank or who you are. He's saying that I don't care who you are. I'm willing to give wisdom to all. Whether you're Solomon or whether you're you or some bum on the street, I am willing to give to all, and I don't see rank when I do it. So that's pretty powerful. Um, when we ask, though, it says we need to ask without doubting and with confidence. Because it says if we're not asking with confidence, then we're like the waves of the sea, agitated. And I think if you think about... Um, when I was a kid in Ohio, we only went to one place. It seemed like all people from Ohio went to Myrtle Beach just over and over again. Like, that was it. That's all you did. Maybe you get crazy and go to, like, Hilton Head. Or I don't know. But it was, it was always the same. And those beaches, to me, like, didn't portray this the way I needed it to because it's just kind of smooth, running slope up and down. Uh, but then I went to Hawaii, and there's, like, rocky coast and water just trashing against it and blowholes where water is coming up in and out. That's more the picture they're describing here is that if you are – not asking with confidence, you're, you're wish wash, you're moving back and forth, torn up and down, left and right. You're the opposite of that word we talked about before, which is steadfast, calm, resilient, you know, re able to respond to things. You're, you're not responding the same way. Uh, and so it's saying that you're like the waves of the sea where you're inconsistent and you're restless. Um, so why do, we, why do we need wisdom? You know, what, why does, how does wisdom relate to the process of going through trials? Um, doesn't say specifically, but uh, I'll give you my, my two cents on it. If I think about my life and going through trials, I'm going to need some wisdom and some discernment to understand, uh, one, what is a trial and what isn't, and also what that rock and sediment is in my life. What is that thing that he's trying to show me I need to remove, especially something I hold on to so valuably and I already care about. I need wisdom to understand how it's different. Um, and so when we ask, he's going to help us understand trials better. So the implication is that uh, we need to go to God during our trials, ask him for wisdom, and then believe that, that he will give us wisdom to understand those trials. Okay, we saw the process. We saw that wisdom is critical. The, the last few verses talk about how um, humility plays a role in, in our response to trials. So verses 9 through 11. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like the flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat, it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes. So also, lost my place, uh, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So it says that the lowly or humble brother, and here it's talking about the word humiliation, 
And again, if you're like me, humiliation, I, I associate with kind of embarrassment, persecution, things like that. But it's talking about just an extremely low level of humility. Um, it's more from that root word, so being humble. And what uh, the description I saw was a, a lowness or a an appropriate perception of your spiritual littleness compared to God. Um, and so having humility, understanding who God is in trials can also help us in our perspective. And I think, again, kind of spec, I'm a big person on extremes, and then there's somewhere in the middle that I think we need to be. So um, when you think about your relationship with God and when, when humanity thinks about your relationship with God, they usually go one way or the other. W one side is um, God is this scary, huge, amazing, powerful person, and I am super, super afraid. I cannot approach him, and, and I don't want to even look, right? So that's one side. The other side is this idea that um, Jesus is my buddy, Jesus is my friend, you know, like, like there's this idea that we're buds, we're cool, like he gets it when I do stuff stupid, and I get when he does stuff that I don't like to, so like we're, we're, we're good. So there's these extremes, but you know, you've seen both. I'm sure you've, you, you've seen both. Um, but in between is this idea that God is omnipotent, powerful, scary, and we should fear him and be in awe of what he's able to do and what he has done. We should have that perception. And I think usually we lean too far this way. We probably could lean more on the understanding of who, how great he is and how small we are compared to him. But yet God in his infinite wisdom sent his son to die on a cross so that we could be his and we could be called sons and daughters of his. Okay, that's the in-between. It's this idea that, yes, I do have a role with him and I have a relationship where I can approach him, but he is still mighty and powerful and strong. And so I think in-between there is that place where we need to be. And so what this is saying is that if you want to understand how God's working a trial in your life, you need to have humility and understanding who he is and how great he is. In that sense, if God, omnipotent, omniscient, he's everywhere, he's all-knowing, can look down and see your life and see your trials, do you think he has a better perspective on what he's doing in your life than you with the blinders on looking at that thing, right? If we believe that, then we should have confidence and feel better about the situation knowing that he's in control and he knows where that thing's going to go eventually. And you can look back on your life, and I know you can look at the trials and see how God used it. I know you can all do that and say, God used that for a reason. He grew me through that. He developed this relationship. He sent me down a path to do X, Y, Z. God used it to grow you. And so we can have, through an appropriate understanding of who God is, we can have peace through our trials knowing that he's in control. Uh, this actual word used for spiritual littleness is actually only used three other times in the New Testament. I thought that was pretty interesting um, to kind of encapsulate this idea we're trying to talk about. Uh, Luke 148, when Mary realizes she's going to give birth to the Messiah. That's pretty interesting, right? So she, she realizes how low she is and small she is, yet she was chosen. Pretty interesting. I love that there's a word that can encapsulate kind of that, that same idea. Um, Acts 828, when it talks about Old Testament references to the lamb being brought to the slaughter. So again, a lamb that's small and little and nothing, yet being chosen and selected for the sacrifice. Um, and then Philippians 3.21 is a promise where Jesus says he's going to transform that, that lowness into to glory in the end. He's going to bring that to completion. It's pretty cool. So we see how hum humility can help us in our perspective of understanding a right view of who God is. Uh, I think humility also helps us understanding how to interact with each other when it comes to trials. Um, we're too judgy. I think we all realize that. Um, we're very quick to judge each other, especially in the, in the church. And there's so many verses about loving each other in the church specifically uh, yet we judge very quickly. Um, and I'm sure you've been like me. Let's go back to Facebook. You see someone talking about a trial in their life, and you're like, really? Really? That's hard? I dealt with five times that last week. And, and I'm fine. They don't see me posting about it on Facebook, right? We, we, we do those things where we, we compare our trials to others and, and, and assume they're harder or worse based on whatever reason. Um, or a type of trial they're dealing with is different. Well, again, let's go back to what we talked about. M my things work. Yours might not be work. So you might be like, why is he so upset about this work thing? So we can judge based on our perspective. And, and I think it's really important that we understand that the point of view you have on a, on a thing, and you can almost never know a full picture based on someone's background, their worldview, their family, their current life circumstances, their, their secret thoughts. Those all play into how someone perceives a trial. So you can't say that you don't understand what they're going through. Tim Keller, again, sorry, I love the guy. He gives another example of, of a really great illustration of this. So imagine you broke your leg. Okay, everybody, you now have a broken leg. You go and you get surgery and you go to physical therapy over several weeks and you go see the doctor and you have a conversation with him and he goes, hey, I got good news and bad news. The good news is you can do everything you did before. You have full mobility. You're awesome. You're great. You're like, okay, what's the bad news? 
He goes, oh, you can't figure skate. Sorry. You're like, I don't figure skate. I don't care. Everything is perfect. Everything's fine because I don't figure skate. Okay? Take someone in their third year of their four-year prep to the Olympics. They're an Olympic skater. They've been dreaming this their whole lives. They're working every day, day in and day out. And you give them the same surgery, the same PT, and the same diagnosis. And what happens to them? They're destroyed. They're destroyed. It's the same thing. It's the same trial. Why is it different? Perspective. And so I think that's important when we look at other people is that we should be encouraging and helping each other and asking questions and relating to each other because then we can better understand and help encourage as the way the Bible tells us to do. And so I think we need to be careful how we judge others for what they're going through in their trial. Okay, uh, a little bit of humility goes a long way in that. So we must approach trials humbly. Um, okay, last verse, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Um, so it's saying again, blessed is the man who's steadfast. So, so you're going to be blessed if you are able to understand this process and remain steadfast. I, the, the idea of patience came to mind, and there's a, a, a few verses at the end of James. You don't have to turn there, but I will for you. In James chapter 5, verse 7 through 8, it says this. And the title is Patience in Suffering. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I'm from Ohio. Met my new friends from Ohio over here. And so uh, there's a lot of farming going on in Ohio and, and not much else. But there's a lot of farming going on. And in those, so I'm really familiar with this idea of you plant in the spring and you harvest in the fall. And there's a process. Um, you have roles to play throughout that process. But in the end, you're not the one growing the crops. It's God. And so I think it's a great example of this process because it's going to, one, take time. Uh, you have a role to play and asking for wisdom, but at the same time, God's the one who's going to build that growth. It's all his, pro it's, it's his program. We're just the players. And so I think if we keep that in mind, that God is in control of all those things, it will help us that it's an active process, but it takes time. I'll repeat Philippians 1.6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So we know that God's going to complete that work, uh, but we can help it along. In closing, I'll say uh, just a few comments. So, um, what we know from this is that God wants to develop steadfastness in you. He wants to develop perfection in you. He wants you to have joy, but a different kind of joy than you might have thought of. Uh, he wants you to see that there's nothing more important than him, that everything will disappoint you, but he never will. And if we're able to realize this, then we'll be more prepared for trials, we'll be less surprised by them, and we'll know how to respond, ultimately bringing more glory to the one who deserves glory. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we love you and thank you for the opportunity we have to, to be in your house, to be worshiping freely, to have your word proclaimed freely uh, without fear of persecution, even in another country. We're so grateful for that. We ask, Lord, that as you, we ask collectively for wisdom. We ask that you would give us wisdom to understand the different challenges our life faces, that we'd appreciate and understand that you may be working something in us that's bigger than what we can see right in front of our face, that you will bring all things together for good, for your glory, not for ours. Help us not to belittle each other. Help us not to think poorly upon each other, but yet encourage one another in the Lord. That we listen to each other, pray for each other, that we'd understand that this is a walk that you put us on to make us holy, not to make us happy. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you know what we need even when we don't. 